the top of your screen. Okay, thanks everyone for joining the EdMaps um, training. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a few uh, quick things. Uh, I recommend that you have, while you're taking the training, if you can, have two windows or tabs or maybe three tabs open. One is the, the conference uh, meeting that we're having now. Uh, the, no the other tab would be our uh, Colorado Noxious Weed page because we are gonna refer to this really briefly. Uh, and then the third tab uh, would be the EdMaps. And, um, and if you can uh, log in, because you're not gonna be able to see uh, or try some of these things it, unless you are logged in. And so if you haven't already created an EdMaps account, uh, go ahead and do that now. Uh, if you don't know what the address is, it's edmaps.org. Um, and there's a link at the bottom of my email if uh, you want to, um, instead of typing in the web address, if you want to go there. Okay, so the first thing I want to just show you is um, our Colorado Noxious Weed uh, webpage. And that is down here, we have this Noxious Weed mapping link. And um, basically, in the state of Colorado, along with the rest of the nation, uh, the Western states, the Western Governors Association, the National or the North American Invasive Species Management Association, all the federal agencies such as USGS, BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, etc., Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, and, and many, many other counties and state agencies, um, as well as Canada, have all agreed to share data at the highest level with into uh, by everyone submitting their data uh, locally into one of four databases. And so one of the databases that we're putting our data into uh, at our level for our states and counties and cities and um, and even you know ecologists and the Native Plant Society or whoever uh, is EdMaps. Um, Another program is uh, that you might be familiar with, especially Lucy, is IMAP Invasives. Um, or uh, there are some other like iNaturalists. Um, nonetheless, all of those are sharing data with each other. We've made agreements with the state heritage programs and all those other entities that I just mentioned to all pull the data together because people recognize that um, invasive species, all taxa, is becoming a super impactful and important uh, issue that we need to just do a much better job on collaborating with. And uh, coronavirus <laughs> is an example, the, the killer, the giant killer wasp or bee or whatever hornet that they have been discussing in the news like in the last day or two, that's another example. Um, so people are recognizing that. So on our webpage, we have, uh, if you scroll down to the middle, Here's some old information about um, how to work with EdMaps. Their website has changed. But in order to share data, whether it's that we're putting data into EdMaps or someone else is putting data into one of the other four data, three databases, in order to do that, you have to have a common language so that one database can talk to the other database. And so we refer to that as data standards. And uh, I encourage you to go to our website, open up the data standards, and download it and save it and read it. Um, it is kind of a long document, like six pages, but it will explain to you a lot of what I'm going to touch on today, but I won't have time to touch on. But in particular, um, if you scroll down, you'll see a subset of fields or attributes or information or data that needs to be collected and optional data that we encourage that may be useful for you locally uh, or important uh, to know for instance what herbicide to apply at what time of year um, but more importantly and, and then how like talking about scale and size like how do we actually do this on the ground but also more importantly is this table right here which uh, describes this is basically what I call the data standards themselves, or some people call it a data dictionary. 
It tells you how the database can read the data and what it means. So in other words, if I look at the second column here, I look at com name. That would be if you can imagine a table, um, the top of the Excel spreadsheet or the top of the table for that column, that's what the, the header, the column header would be called. And it does need to be spelled just like that in all capitalized letters, just like this, no spaces, 10 characters or less. And then, so the, that's a short, that's short for common name, obviously. And so if we were filling out the information or providing the data, this is how it would look. And um, this is, you know, the human readable explanation of what it is. And uh, there's a specific definition. Um, uh, and then this last column is basically what we call the data type. Uh, and so it just is like, how, how is the data supposed to be formatted? So that's all kind of like boring database information, but it's super important. So an example is rec basis. So what that means, rec basis is, what is the basis of the record? Like why, how did you determine uh, that there is this record that should be reported or this observation that should be reported? And so the this uh, dark, bold font here these are the options that you have to answer that question so you can imagine maybe this is like a drop down pick from one of these options but don't create your own option or don't create a shortcut to say oh preserve specimen i don't want to spell that out i'm just going to put ps you know so don't abbreviate um so this is kind of like how we control the language so that one database can talk to another and so that everybody is on the same page about what kind of information we're collecting and what it means. Um, and so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. I'm not gonna spend a ton of information on here, but this is really important. So please do download it and read it. And again, you can also send a chat. Uh, it will be hard for me to monitor the chat as I'm showing you um my screen but uh please feel free to do so um so that is that let me go back uh to our web page really quick to show you a couple other things we have uh, as i said this uh information on edmaps it is old but it is kind of still relevant um there is a mobile app uh, that we'll go over briefly but uh, there's some screenshots here and some step-by-step -step instructions uh, also if you don't want to um read uh, and you want to go to a video, these are old as well, but uh, especially using the mobile app, that's the basic one that's um, still useful. And then if you decide uh, that you don't want to use Edmaps, uh, which is fine, you still need to have this background that I'm sharing with you now. There's lots of other ways you can submit your data, and that's one of the reasons why we selected Edmaps, but it comes with the caveat. If you use anything else besides Edmaps to submit your data, you have to format your data so that it meets these data standards that I mentioned here. It has to be formatted this way. Um, and that could be a heavy lift for someone. And so I've provided some common tools that people are using to help you get towards that effort. Um, so if you do decide to use anything else to collect information, uh, please let me know. Uh, and um, and I can try to help you uh, work through that. Um, but I just wanted to share that information with you. Um, so let's go to Edmaps really quick. Uh, so this is their website. And I'm just gonna go over some uh, real basic stuff here uh, that you probably could figure out on your own, but I find uh, it's useful to see it. And uh, there's a couple tricks in here that you uh, may not uh, know about uh, or it may be harder to find. Um, so first let's go to the report sightings page. Uh, so once you have your login, um, people can use, uh, you can get your data into Edmaps directly using Edmaps in one of three ways. One is to use the web form that I'm showing you right now. 
The second way is to use their free mobile apps. They have two of them. One's EdMaps and the other one's EdMaps Pro. The third way is you use whatever other option that you decide to use, whether it's pen and paper or Agterra Strider form or it's ArcGIS or it's some other data logger or a handheld Garmin or a Trimble or whatever you use. You would still have to set up your your uh, your app or your device to collect the information, all the information that's needed and in the format, but then you bulk upload it. Um, so those are three ways. And so right now I'm just going to show you under the report signings, uh, the web based way to get data in here, just so you can um, uh, basically see what I mean about data standards. And so you have a big picture of uh, how the database is constructed. So uh, if you're looking at plants, you just click on the plants and then click on the state, which is Colorado. And here will be uh, how you enter the data. It's pretty much drop down menu and it's pretty easy to submit right here on the website. So you could just start typing in the common name or uh, the Latin name if you happen to know that. Um, or if you really wanted, you could scroll down forever, but you know, there's a million uh, species in here, so I wouldn't necessarily do that, but you could. Um, and then uh, we encourage you to pick one of these. Uh, it's not required, only the fields that are red are required, but we do encourage that. If you're treating it, you might as well claim that you're treating it right away. But if you're just uh, reporting it for the first time, you know, then just pick positive, that's fine. You, It'll default to today's date. You can always enter an earlier date in here, like if this is something you saw yesterday, for instance. And then um, we're gonna ask <clears throat> you, we prefer that you enter in infested area. Uh, if you have survey area, that's fine to enter that as well, but we really do prefer this. Now, uh, you don't have to type this in right now because I'll show you how that gets auto-populated in a minute. But I want to explain the difference between infested area and survey area really quick. Uh, infested area is if you have a, okay, let's take the scenario. You have a two-mile stretch of road and you have canned thistle on one side of the road, you know, a couple patches, a couple plants here and there, you know, scattered along the road. That two-mile stretch of road is your survey area. Infested area is if you are going to take every single one of those can of thistle plants, bunch them up into a corner, and then so that it's a hundred percent cover of just that plant, and then the space that that plant itself occupies is infested area. So it's really hard, uh, and it's kind of like esoteric, but there is a big difference. And so we do prefer infested area. And if you're not certain about infested area, because it's very easy to overestimate this. I recommend that you underestimate it. And I, when I say underestimate it, I say, you know, say that it's like 10 square feet or, um, you know, uh, a couple plants, you know, like uh, maybe it's like one square foot or one square meter or 0 0.0001 acres. Um, because then you can always update the information later. Um, <clears throat> So that is uh, my recommendation on infested area if you don't know. Uh, we also, and again, I'll show you how that gets populated in a second. We, it's not required, but we do recommend that you pick habitat because that provides people information about in the future about how to treat it. Uh, and we do ask for one measure of abundance. And so they have, they provide you with two options, percent cover, and here's your controlled language here. Uh, if you think back about the data standards that I showed you before, this is what I mean by controlled language and a drop down so that people don't have to type in trace. It just, you pick it in there, it's spelled correctly, and it's consistent no matter who is recording the data. Uh, or you can pick abundance, whatever is easier. I think probably for most people, abundance is a little bit easier to uh, visualize. Uh, but some people are actually collecting quantitative data, and so in that case, you probably do want percent cover.
percent cover, by the way, is more useful scientifically. Uh, for instance, if we we're going to do predictive modeling, uh, we would need percent cover, not necessarily abundance. Um, it's hard to translate qualitative information into quantity, but it's very easy to go from quantity to qualitative. Um, so that's my pitch on that. Uh, it's not required, but we do recommend that you uh, submit or collect information on phenology. Again, this could influence, A, what kind of herbicides you applied. It will help you locally and help your neighbors uh, decide when is the best time to treat uh, or to apply a certain herbicide. And also, this gives us really valuable information in case things are changing, for instance, due to climate or some other factor. Um, and uh, damage is not required either. State and county are required. Um, and so what I'm gonna do now though, to show you the infested acre is I'm just gonna zoom into this area and I'm just going to, uh, I'm gonna record my infestation. So you can put one point or multiple lines or multiple polygons and the way that you draw is you use your mouse and you left click once left click once and then double click to close and notice that even if you're not close like right on it if you're close it'll close the polygon for you as long as you left double click and so let's say those are my infested areas or maybe that's my gross area. Okay, so that's less than an acre. That's looking good. But let's say that that's actually gross or survey area. And so notice that when you draw on that map below, it is going to auto populate infested area. And so if in fact you are showing that that is the gross area, then just co copy and paste it here and then reduce this, you know, like maybe it's 0 0.001 or something. Um, you can map survey area first, uh, and that might be a better idea. And you do that by just clicking this balloon here, and then it'll go through the same process. And again, you have, you can't record a, 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 a point with survey area, but you can draw a polygon, okay? So that's how that works. <clears throat> Notice when I draw my polygon, it's gonna auto populate for me the county and the lat long. That is ideal. You don't want people to have to record this information. You want it to auto calculate for people. So if you're using a third party device or even pen and paper or a GPS, uh, you're gonna wanna think about some of these things. Also, if you make a mistake, you just clear the map. Okay, and notice it does not change that information. So, you know, you're going to have to reevaluate maybe that, um, but maybe not if it's in the same location. Um, they do have other conversion tools, like if you have an address or, you know, if you want to go from uh, decimal degrees, which is that's what how we prefer the information collected, uh, or some people are collecting latitude in degrees, minutes, seconds. Uh, that's a way you can use their tool to convert it. Again, we do prefer decimal degrees. So um, also you can put uh, notes here. It's not required. We It does allow you, the database allows you to collect addresses, but we are requesting that you abide by state privacy laws uh, and not to put any personal identifiable information in this. Uh, at all. So if you can um, use some nondescript language like, you know, project, you know, Bald Mountain or something, and then you just know that associated with Bald Mountain is landowner, you know, Bob and landowner um, Karen, then, you know, you, you can associate uh, the addresses in that way. But yeah, please don't put personal identifiable information in here. Ownership is again, not required, but it's available. This private radial button is super important. Uh, it's 
it's going to default to no and we prefer that you select no and this is why if you're collecting this information and this is on private property that is okay that's where operating within our our the scope of our duties as noxious weed managers um if you select no then it's it uh what happens is the latitude and the longitude are displayed uh in the distribution map and in the data downloads if you select private it basically hides the exact location of that infestation and it hides it from everyone the only people that can see that information are you the actual person that submitted the data and me the person at department of ag that um verifies the data so that means your partners can't see the data your temporary employees can't see the data uh your co-workers cannot see the data your uh no one, not even your pre the person that comes and takes your position after you decide to get a promotion or, or you know, retire or whatever. So um, we suggest uh, that you select yes for private radial button only when it's a very politically sensitive situation. For instance, uh, your county commissioner's son has noxious weeds and you're reporting it. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a politically sensitive situation or the landowner is super irate and you're uh, about to enforce on them. You know, I mean, it's very unlikely the landowner or even the county commissioner's son is going to even know about this database. But it's kind of like um, an out for you in those very um, sensitive uh, situations. So know that that's available, but that's how it works. <clears throat> And I'll show you what that looks like um, on the data download side. Uh, you can collect images. Uh, it's not required. Uh, the only time we encourage images uh, is A, if you encounter a list A species, B, uh, if uh, you're a new uh, person to the position and we're just like not familiar with you and we're not sure of what you're your skills are in identification. Uh, C, if you have temp employees and uh, you're not sure of their uh, plant identification skills, uh, or uh, D, if you have volunteers, um, like for instance, citizen scientists or a youth corps or something of that nature. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and really we're looking for a close up of the plant so that we can confirm the plant's ID. So we're not asking for landscape photos, uh, even though the scenery may be beautiful or horrific <laughs> because it's fully infested, it's just for the plant ID to confirm it. Now, in some cases, if you have a grant with us, uh, we do ask people to take photo points to capture the before and after. And in that case, you can provide a landscape photo and we only need one per one per plant uh, for that grant cycle. So it's not like you still have to submit a photo for every single population or every infestation or every uh, plant. So uh, that's the situation on that. And then of course you can add uh, additional information and if it's a new species to the state, uh, there are some, uh, or, you know, we're asking for uh, you to collect a voucher specimen so that we can confirm the identity and also so we can submit it to the herbaria in the state. And in that case, we'll need two specimens, one for us and then one for us to send to the herbaria. A two at a minimum. Uh, it would be good to send uh, herbaria specimens to multiple herbaria but um, that's a, another discussion we can have offline. So um, are there any questions about that? Feel free to speak up anytime. It doesn't have to be right at this moment. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Uh, I'm not gonna submit that data because it's just a test. I'm gonna show you what it looks like on the distribution map side. So I'm not gonna pull up a uh, can of thistle because there's like a trillion, points there but uh let's see i am going to pull up something 
Um, let's see here. Let's do black henbane. That seems reasonable. And notice I did click on the plant name to get this map. Uh, so here you'll notice uh, <clears throat> that there's multiple toggles here. I'll show you what those are in a minute. Um, what comes up when you click on the name of the plant is you get this nice map uh, that shows you uh, internationally where it's located. And also over here in the top right hand corner is the legend. So you can see how many plants were reported as treated versus just reported. Over here in the bottom corner is your zoom in and zoom out. And so uh, you can just zoom in like you would in Google Maps. And then uh, once you have a login and a password, you can click on any balloon in here and you can see who reported that infestation and when it was reported. And then if you click on the record ID, which is really important, I'll refer to this in the future, um, <clears throat> then it'll give you the full report. And so this is an example of one where the, la the Latin long is showed. And so they selected no for that private radio button. And notice they did a good job. They underreported. And maybe this is really the true infestation. But if they didn't know, then uh, it was underreported. But this to me looks pretty accurate. And uh, they provided uh, photos so that we can confirm the plants. Um, and notice you can zoom in if you can't see it. Um, so that's helpful. Click on the X to get rid of that. And also notice you can scroll down and you can toggle between the map view or the satellite view and you can zoom in and you can zoom out. So you can see right away what kind of terrain, if you're like going to treat this plant or you're looking for this plant, you can see what's around it. And so you can plan accordingly based on just this satellite image that you're seeing of the surrounding area. Okay, if you um, so desired, you could download a PDF of this and take it out with the, in the field with you if you really wanted to. But notice uh, there is this revisit button. Okay, so what EdMaps is, it's a relational database. What that means is you submit your original record and that original record stays in the database and it's associated or it's unique with this record ID. So this is sort of like its fingerprint. And then what happens is any additional information just gets appended on top of this original record. And so instead of going and uh, re and reporting this again as a brand new observation, the correct thing would be to do is to report any site visits or treatments as a revisit. And so to do that, you can just click on revisit and notice here's your original record right here. And here's the new record that's appended on top of it. And notice you in the new record, you can select anything that you want here. And there's still all the same same options that you have before and then uh your name gets auto populated and on and on and so you can report a treatment by doing a revisit or report a monitoring uh or evaluation or, or whatnot so um <clears throat> let me see let me go back so i'm going to x out of that <clears throat> And I have my uh, internet, my Google Chrome set up so it just opens new tabs. So you'll have to be careful about how you set it up if it's opening new tabs for you or if you're gonna have to hit the back button. Okay, so um, uh, that's the same across the board. So even if you have 10 records, which are like, for instance, reported here, it's the same principle. Uh, this, the, um, I don't know if you saw that, but when the numbers uh, come up in the circle, that tells you how many records were reported in close proximity to one another. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> excuse me. So that is uh, the report uh, or the reported um, records. And so what happens is uh, if you report a record either on the website or using your EdMaps mobile app or using a Garmin, and it gets sent to the database through your account, um, 
then what happens is it comes to me and Patty. And what we do is we um, look at the records and I'll show you what that view looks like. And uh, we're looking, uh, this is our, our page here that's only um, you know available to me and Patty. Um, we can see who reported something, when it was reported and when it was uploaded in the database. And what we do is we just click on the record ID. We look at the contents of the information. We look specifically at infested area. This person didn't report any infested area. And then, um, and then there's no record. Now, I don't actually happen to know this person. And so I'm probably going to say, hey, John, you know, it looks like you're a, a legit company, but I don't really know you. So I'm going to request more information. Um, or in this case, uh, let's go to another page here. Um, okay, Christina Alba, I know her. She's a botanist. Uh, she's reporting Siberian elm. Uh, I know her specifically. She's a professional. She, you know, she uh, has a degree. And not that that matters or not, but she's trained specifically in plant identification, and she's provided photos, and she's provided infested area. No, she has not. Okay, she didn't report infested area, but she's provided photos, so at least I can look to see, huh, did she report this plant correctly? And it looks like it is a tree and she's reporting it and here's where it's located. So uh, I could go down and then I could uh, verify the record. And then so after we verify the record, then it shows up in the view that we saw before, which is this view right here. So again, the data gets entered by someone in the field it comes to us to be verified and then after we verify it verify it then it gets published or it gets sent back to the reporter to say hey we need some more information we're not really sure you know we're not feeling so, so confident in this particular report and that's the same whether you use the app the website or a third party and you bulk upload the data okay uh once you um uh go to the distribution map and you pull up a species, you can download the data. Right here, you can download a shapefile, a Google Earth image, or a CSV file. If you do that from this view, you're gonna get the entire data set for the entire country. And you're not gonna wanna do that in most cases because it's gonna be an, a huge data set and it's gonna be too much information. You're not gonna need it. You know, why Why would you need infestations for Canada unless you're just curious or you're doing some kind of research? I would not go this route for downloading data. Um, you can, though, if you have a login and password. Um, so I'll show you another way to download data that's specific to narrow it down. But really quick, I want to show you this other thing here. If you click on counties, <clears throat> here it shows you just, you, you know, kind of a quick look on presence absence. Uh, reported in the counties. So this is uh, interesting. This is a very consistent view as what's in the USDA plants database. And notice if you hover, it'll tell you how many times it was uh, reported for that county. Um, also under the same view, you can look at a number of other uh, levels of information, including uh, which observations came strictly from the literature versus from a field observation. Uh, and also you can look at predictive models about future spread. Uh, and so here uh, you can decide if you wanna look at one model or six models and it will change. And just know this, that notice if you use one model, the range is quite larger than if you use 10 models. And that's a statistical issue it's not really an issue, but basically uh, there are some statistical calculations that penalize you for using too many models. And so that's an artifact of just the statistics. But anyway, you can see uh, predictive information if you wanna plan that out. And then also it'll tell you how certain we are about the prediction. Um, 
And so that's just useful information that you can also um, share and download and whatever. Uh, <clears throat> now, to get more specific information, and this is probably the bulk of what you're going to want to use this information for, is tools and training. <sighs> that This tab is where you query down in the database. And notice on here, you can, uh, if you forget anything I tell you, uh, you can always go to, under the training materials and also notice they do have EdMaps Pro here. I highly encourage you, if you are a professional and you're going to be doing uh, treatments or monitoring, that you definitely use the EdMaps Pro app and definitely download this information and it walks you through it step by step. But let's go back to querying the database. So uh, to query the database, I find the best tool that they have uh, is this advanced query tool. Uh, and if you click on it, what happens is it brings up a bunch of questions that you can answer. Now, how this works is imagine you have every single record in the entire database for every taxa, and you wanna narrow the search down to just give you what you want. So the more information you fill in here, the narrow, narrower your search becomes. Now, let's say I just want to know everything that's reported in my county, no matter who reported it or when it was reported or what species it was. In that case, I would leave all of this blank and I would go right down to state, fill out state, and I'll go right down to county and I'm going to pick Moffitt because we have someone from Moffitt. And then hit submit. And it'll show you, uh, here's a good, so it'll show you how many records in total were uh, submitted over the years and how many have exact locations. So this is an artifact of that private radio button. What this is telling me is if these two numbers were exactly the same, then that meant that every single record. Uh, the private radio button was uh, no. But because these are different, that says about half of those records were submitted as private, and therefore we can't see them. Um, so that uh, Jesse, is, <laughs> who's on the phone, is an unfortunate situation because unless he has those exact records, he's not going to know where that information was reported, you know, unless it's in his office file cabinet somewhere. But let's just zoom in so you can see where things were reported. And again, this is just one. This is every species that's ever been reported in the county. So, um, you know, it wouldn't be too useful just to look at a map like this, but you could, you know, poke around and see, okay, who's been doing the most reporting in the county over the years? And uh, you can kind of get an idea. Oh, it's the USGS. Okay, well, that's good information. Okay, so if you want to know, what was reported this is where the download tool comes in handy so in this case you could download just an excel file but if you're using any sort of mapping software you're probably going to want to use a shape file or google earth and uh what happens is when you select that it's going to um send you an email uh and then it's going to give you a link in the email uh and it's going to tell you to um, go get your data by clicking on that link. And let me just show you really quick um, what that link looks like. So it, it's gonna come from Ed Maps Bugwood. And uh, so let's see, you're gonna wanna make sure that your email is set up to accept Ed Maps Bugwood information. And oh, here, here's an example right here your edmaps data is ready for download and this is what it looks like and it'll summarize basically what i requested and here's the link and so you just click on the link and you go get it <clears throat> so make sure you set your email up so that your bugwood emails are not going to spam <laughs> in essence okay so that is um the data download and querying in a nutshell and this is probably the most useful tool but again, uh, remember that this record ID 
that is your link. That is your, your fingerprint for all the information that's already been reported. And so the, this number is very, very important um, it, so that you can uh, append new information. And so you're not reporting the same infestation multiple times. Um, or in that, cause that creates a duplicate records. Um, and nobody likes that. So, um, that is that. Let's see. Any questions? Uh, I guess I haven't checked in in a while. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Um, you can always, uh, contact me later if you have questions. Um, so I'm going to go back to the tools and training really quick. In addition to the training tools and the advanced query, which I find the most useful, uh, there's all these other tools as well. Remember I told you uh, if you had an address and you wanted to get the Latin long for it, this is how you would do that. Uh, you just click on it and you fill out the information and it gives it to you right away. It's very useful. Um, also, if you are using third party, then uh, you're gonna need to do the bulk upload. Okay, so if you're using a Garmin, pen and paper, Agterra, ArcGIS, Trimble, or any other thing that I haven't mentioned, bulk upload. And so how do you do that? So I go out today with my Garmin, I collect some information on it. And remember the Garmin isn't set up to collect all the correct information. So I'm gonna have to keep a record either in a notebook or in an Excel spreadsheet or something that I append uh, with that GPS record. But um, basically, the way that you do that to upload it is you go to my Edmaps up here at the top. And over here on the left is your, uh, your links. And you're going to do just click right here on bulk uploads. And again, click on upload data. And really, it's just a Dropbox. So you select your data and you drop it in here. Okay, I do want to say one thing about shapefiles. For instance, if you are using uh, Esri or even a GPS that you've converted to a shapefile. Uh, really quick, I'm going to just show you what a shapefile actually is. And I know this is probably not something that you care about, but <clears throat> a shapefile is actually made up of anywhere between three to five files. So that is an example here. Uh, this point file has just four. Uh, it has the shape, a shape, a projection, and the table, okay? Uh, another example could be, let's see, um, I can find another example really quick. Okay, here, this is one shape file. And so when I go to bulk upload this data uh, for this plant into uh, Edmaps, I have to make sure that I get all of these files and, and put them in the Dropbox. If I forget just one of these files, then it's gonna corrupt the data and it's not gonna be usable. And they're gonna reject it and send you an email and say, you're missing the .shx file. Please submit it. And then you're going to panic and you're going to call me and you're going to say, what's going on? So remember, if you're submitting a, a shapefile, it's totally fine. It's totally legitimate. But make sure you grab all of these files and upload them into uh, the Edmaps bulk uploader. Um, Let's see, let, please uh, do let me know if you have any questions. Uh, let's go back to uh, my head maps. Yeah, does someone have a question? No. Nope. Okay. Um, there's a couple things that you can do to make your life a little bit easier. Uh, and that is to set up uh, alerts. And so to do that, again, you go to my head maps and you click on alerts. And then what this does is whatever you decide to get uh, that you want an email notice for, you fill it out here. And so uh, basically you would have to do it for every plant, for instance, that you wanted, such as I've done here. So I'm gonna get an email 
automated email for every single time something regarding absinthe wormwood is submitted. Okay, and I'm um, doing it for the entire state. So if I wanted just for one county, then I would select that county here. So uh, what that does is again, it sends you these automated emails that tells you exactly, you know, what was submitted and who submitted it and when. And it's just uh, useful for staying on top of what's going on in your county locally. Um, also, if you go into my species list, you can um, create your own custom lists here. Uh, and so I do encourage you to do that. Um, now, I don't know how I'm going to show you the mobile apps, but um, kind of just uh, going back to the home. Yeah, I don't have a way to uh, share my app with you or my mobile device. But basically, if you go to the home button, um, you know, this is where you go to download the app. Uh, you could probably also go to the Google Store or the Apple Store to find it. But um, uh, this is probably the best way to do it. Uh, and then it's going to take you here and then it's going to give you the ability to download the Pro or the regular. And again, uh, download the Pro. I don't think I'm gonna have time to go over that with you today, but um, it is there. And here's the link if you wanna do it the legit way through your store. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, Lucy, Or do you have any questions? Cause I know you specifically uh, requested this training and you had some questions. So I'm gonna give you a minute first to uh, to just give some feedback or to ask any questions at this time. And remember, if you want to talk, uh, use your mouse and hover and then unmute your mic there. Yes, one question I would have is the difference between the mobile apps, the pro and the non-pro. Yeah, good question. And then um, the other yeah. question would be, if I'm not in a situation where I can I, I, if I don't have access to ArcGIS and that sort of thing, um, is it possible to get access to data, in particular my data, from what I've entered in without getting it as a shapefile? Yes, yeah, so um, let's go to that. So if you wanna access just your data that you've entered, so click on my Ed Maps. And then um, it's gonna show you kind of like your, your basically um, your metrics for yourself right here, but also some other metrics as you can see by state or whatever. But to access your data, you click on uh, reports here on the left-hand side. And this is everything what you're seeing now that I've entered myself, okay? And so um, uh, if I, Let's say for this Tamrisk um, entry, let's say I, uh, I, it's too bad I can't scroll over. Uh, let's say I wanna, uh, I have new information and um, what I reported here, I wanna modify slightly. Like let's say I didn't know what species of Tamrisk it was and, and I've confirmed the ID so I wanna go back and amend this. So you would just click on that. Let me go back to it. It's edit right there. If you want to view it, you can click view or you can click the record here. Uh, I'll click the record and then it's going to bring up the view if you want to see that. If you want to see a map of your data, okay, then you're going to go to tools and training and you're going to do advanced query and then you're going to type in your name. How do you spell your name, Lucy? Is it L C L U C? L U C Y. Okay, and your last name? Bauer, B-A-U-E-R. Okay, so let me do me. Oops. And then, and if I don't fill anything else out, it's gonna give me everything, including if I didn't report, if I reported things out of state. So I'm just gonna do this. And so this shows I have, I've reported 81 records 
with ex and all of them have exact locations. So I selected no for the private radio button and it comes out to about 10,000 acres, which is a lot, holy moly. And then uh, this will show me where it is. And so if you just want a map, uh, you can do it this way. And if you actually wanna download this, uh, you just go up here and you can download a CSV file or you can use a Google Earth file. Um, so did that answer your question about retrieving your data? Yes, I think so. I'll have to kind of play around with that and okay. get familiar with it. Yeah, and the, the My Ed Maps uh, also, you know, there's a bunch of uh, information here. Again, you can look at the reports. Uh, you can look at your bulk uploads. Oops. I think uh, I don't have any bulk uploads, so because um, I just use their site or their, their apps, uh, I find it's easier and faster. Um, my surveys as well, if you are looking for plants or whatever. So there's lots of tools and a lot of them are underutilized. But um, yeah, that is where you would do that. And I, I am uh, I haven't been using Edmaps Pro recently because I haven't been in the field um, since probably last summer or last fall, but um, you know, here you can create your own list again. And then um, if you wanna set up projects, you can do that here as well. So there's lots of new tools that they're always adding as well. But um, if you're not sure what some of these things do or everything that's available, I would go to the tools and training and just kind of look to see if um, some of these answer some of your questions. Um, and, uh, if they don't, you can always submit a question, um, uh, to them. You can email them or you can, of course, email us or give us a call at the Department of Ag. We're always happy to, um, to answer questions. Now, in, in terms of the apps, so, um, you asked about the difference between the mobile app and the Edmaps Pro. So, yeah. um, oops, sorry. Ah, that's not what I wanted. Um, that was the video. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. I wonder if we're missing. Oh, okay. Sorry. It must be in this one. Yeah. So um, the, the mobile app is very basic. And it kind of starts here in the middle of this page and I don't know if you saw that I'll go back to it really quick it's this enter and bulk upload data and if you scroll here this is what the basic app looks like and just scroll down to like about page three and this is basically what the mobile app looks like it's very basic it's it's pretty much for reporting and observation only it's um it's really kind of geared towards like reporting the first record or the first time you see the infestation or anyone sees the infestation or if you can even think about it as uh you know if you're just doing a survey and you're not doing treatment or even if you're using like volunteers or um you know anything of that nature it's really for that and um it, it's very it doesn't give you a lot of options this is what the basically what the reporting page looks like. Uh, you could take a picture, it, it'll auto-populate the date and your name and the plant name after you select it. You click on the map to actually uh, draw the polygon or put the point down. Otherwise, it's gonna assume a point location. And then the only thing that you really have is uh, basically your, your measure of abundance and the estimated infested area. Now, uh, if you are out of cell service, what happens is the record caches on your phone and you have to go into the mobile app, into the Edmaps app, into the, um, the uploads and you have to push it, push the record uh, into the database once you're in cell service um because it, otherwise it'll just cache on your phone and the way you get to that is you just kind of scroll down and it's called the upload queue so you just pick on the up click on the upload queue and then you hit upload and then it'll push it or it'll send it the, the pro app is pretty different uh it's a a, a lot more uh, robust 
And basically what it does is if you can imagine that you already have the data in the database, okay? You already have data in here and you have those um, record IDs that I talked to you about before, uh, these unique record IDs. And so what it's doing is it's in essence checking out a subset of data from the database with all of the information, including the record ID. It's temporarily caching it on your phone. And then it's allowing you to manipulate the reporting information, uh, such as, uh, you know, the um, infested area, all this information here. After you fill it out on your phone and you get back to the office, then you push it back, you check the data back into the database. And, that, and that's really what it's doing. And so it, it is quite different um, in how it works and, and what it's doing. But again, if you look at this, um, this uh, helpful guide that they have on their website, it'll walk you through step by step what each button does and um, how, to, how to do it. But basically it's checking the data out temporarily, you manipulate it, and then it's checking it back into the database. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, uh, is, does anybody else have any questions about that kind of stuff? Okay, um, if you, uh, yeah, oh, I see a chat here. So will the bulk, with bulk up data, data, are you able to do revisits? Um, yes, but there is the caveats, right? So the caveat with bulk uploaded data is first and foremost, you have to make sure that you uh, have your device or your data collection methods, whether it's pen and paper or Agterra, set up uh, with these attributes, plus one additional one, which is that unique record ID. Uh, and that is the hard part, is getting that unique record ID. And so again, I'll just go here. It's this unique record ID. And so in essence, that would be like an empty field. Uh, and then, um, Yes, as long as you have this record ID, you can record a revisit. It's a little bit more complicated. And I do have a tool, which depends on what you're using. I have some tools on our website and I can uh, modify one of them. But uh, basically, if you're using Agterra, you're gonna wanna make sure that you download this Agterra form and you customize it and you watch the video. And basically, I'll just show you, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. And so, uh, and the, the video will walk you through this entire thing. So don't be uh, overwhelmed when you first look at it. But basically, this right here, column B is your, your field, uh, like I said before. So here's common name, here's observation date, infested area, et cetera. So this is the data that's being collected. And so you would just need to build in uh, another row that says uh, record ID, and then uh, and then you're gonna have to have some way to get this record ID. And so ideally, what you would probably do is you would have the EdMaps basic map on your device and your Strider form from Agterra on your device. And then in your Strider form, you would have a blank field for record ID. And then when you're in the field and you're going to treat that plant, uh, then you would open up your EdMaps app. You would get the record ID, type it in or copy and paste it in to your Agterra form. And that's how you could do it. Or, or the same thing if you're using ArcGIS. So, so I will actually modify the Strider form so that there is a record ID on there. Uh, that is a good uh, point that I probably should have thought about before, but I'll, I'll make sure to do that probably by the end of next week. Um, 
that is really the only way that you could do it if you were going to use anything else besides Edmaps Pro. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if we need to go over that in more detail, I'm more than happy to um, to walk through that. But I think if you start uh, by at least uh, watching the video, uh, then that will help uh, a lot. Uh, this video right here. And if you are uh, going to use uh, Esri to collect the data, then I definitely encourage you uh, to let me know, uh, like send me an email today, because next week um, on Monday in the afternoon, I am doing uh, a same kind of thing, a virtual uh, training on how to customize the Esri software. Uh, and we're going to go over revisits at that time because I have a specific mobile app that I've created for uh, reporting revisits. Um, so let's see, let me go back to the questions. Any other questions from anyone? Stephen, how do you feel about uh, this? Is this going to help, do you think? Yes, I messed with it a little bit. I just hadn't submitted anything to have it turned in. Okay. And uh, Jesse, how about yourself? Yeah, this has been very helpful. Okay. And um, let's see, Carl, do you have any questions or? Uh, no, I don't at this time, but I appreciate the uh, introduction to it. It's real helpful. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, um, yeah, if people can start entering their data into here, we're gonna get a more comprehensive view of what's going on in the state. And then at the state level, we definitely use this information to create uh, realistic statewide management plans. Uh, you know, we don't wanna be um, requiring, for instance, eradication in places that are overly infested with hound's tongue, you know, or overly infested with black henbane or canna thistle. And so the, the more data that we can get into the database, it really is in the best interest of all of us. So, um, okay, well, I will um, uh, let you get on with your day. Thanks for attending. Um, if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to give me a call or send an email. And uh, Lucy, if you want to stay on, um, I'll just catch up with you here after everyone gets off. Um, and yeah, thanks again for all your time. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. No problem, thanks. Yes, thank you. Yep.